Look at the size of that boy's head. Shh. I'm not kidding. It's like an orange on a toothpick. Shh. You gotta give the boy a complex. Well, that's a huge noggin. You're listening to the Dune she- Steve um, Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, Rish Outfield, Big Anklevich, and O-H-O-T. Like, there's this great Travis Tritt song. And I was like, you know, I, I don't care. It's like, so, yeah, but I'm, I'm sure you've heard it. Just go on with the story. It's okay. What is this? By Friggin's Mountain. Oh, uh, uh, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 3, page 36. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome back. Oh. I, yeah, that, that was uh, Robot, R-O-8-O-T. I have the patience to talk to Robot today. <laughs> and Announcer Man. Yes, Announcer Man. Thanks for showing up, guys. Now get out. You're all dismissed. Okay. Today's episode, again, is Lost. By Sarah Ashwood. That's right. He refers to the fact that my computer crashed the first time we recorded this. So this really is lost again. The episode for Lost was lost. Is and that irony? See, I never really understand that whole irony. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Thing. Yeah, we, the whole Let's irony thing's a problem. Yeah. Did you say who it was by? Sarah Ashwood. I did. Well, then I'll go on. A genuine Oki from Muskogee, Sarah Ashwood is a full-time college student soon to obtain a BA in English from American Military University. During the course of her collegiate career, she has gained entrance to three international honor societies, Phi Theta Kappa, the Golden Key, and Delta Ypsilon Tau. And now here she has made it into the fourth, the Doonstief Authors Club. How about that? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, doesn't count. All right. International honor? I guess we're international. They didn't say anything about prestige. (laughs) That's right. Just international. Sarah's short work and poetry have appeared in a variety of publications, while her first book, a volume of poetry titled A Minstrel's Musings, was published by Cyber Wizard Productions in April 2009. In 2010, Sarah's young adult fantasy novel Night's Rebirth will be published by the same. Along with her cousin, Carol Green, Sarah is co-editor of the fantasy e-zine Moon Drenched Fables. That's a coincidence. I'm the co-editor of the fanzine Drenched Fables. Yeah. We're just going to pretend you never said that. For more information on Sarah and her writing, please visit www.sarahashwood.com. We'd also like to thank Julie Hoverson from 19 Nocturne Boulevard for lending her voice to today's story. Today's music is by Dancing Willow, and some sound effects were provided by freesound.org. Lost by Sarah Ashwood He's lost to you, laddie. Tis not you can do, save accept that fact and move on. His head in his hands, Nairn released a groan. Lost, he echoed bleakly. What kind of a word was that? How could a single word describe so utterly both his brother and himself? Lost, it echoed, reverberating inside the empty, throbbing halls of his chest. Niall, why? I want vengeance, he stated grimly, raising his head. By Friggin's Mountain, I'll have vengeance upon those lion, thieving, murdering MacNaughtons, if it is my final deed. The face of the clan's elder, bent upon him, was a wrinkled map of mysteries and sorrow. His blue eyes, startling in their intensity, softened now with grief and empathy. Can't be done. As well you can, laddie. The McNaughton clan is far more powerful than our own. They ha- They've gotten that power by reaving our cattle and murdering our cheats. He growled, surging to his feet. That's how they've gotten their power. Tis high time to bring them down, which is just what I mean to do. Nay, Nairn, nay. 
Gently, the old man laid a hand on Nairn's arm. When the young clansman attempted to shake it off, the grip tightened warningly. I've addressed already the Council of Clans. Tis a grievous wrong indeed what the McNaughtons have done to us, stealing your brother away. But what's done is done. T'would hardly do for you to lose your life in the fruitless quest of vengeance. Nor would Niall wish it so. Then what am I to do? He cried in despair, throwing back his head. High, high in the sky, wheeling above the clefts of the twin crags, was a scarlet eagle. Ironically, the symbol of his brother's household. Ironically, the same scarlet eagle he'd seen soaring over his brother's halls the day Niall vanished. In your brother's absence, you are now clan Tanist, replied the elder gravely, full white beard wagging upon his plaid. Which means your brother's responsibilities are now your own. Nairn shot the old man a hard look. You're meaning? He snapped, though in the pit of his stomach, he feared he knew. At five and twenty, his brother, the clan Tanist, second only to the clan's chief, had yet to wed and produce an heir, despite the fact that the clan's elders had long harried him to do so. More than that, the council of clans, comprised of holy bards from each clan, had also demanded the man wed. Links of succession must be maintained. Nairn, his brother Niall's younger and only sibling, was now Tanist by default. Should he perish as his brother had done, the murky, muddy question of succession would arise. Considering the volatile nature of the clans, better he simply do as his brother had lingered to do, marry and sire an heir. But marry who? Wives of chiefs and tanists alike were chosen by clan elders or the council. Who would they deem suitable? I, I see the recognition in your eyes, announced the elder gravely. You know what we expect. You must. Wed and bed and get an heir, finished Nairn sourly. Inside, his aching chest revolted. How could they demand he love a stranger when he just lost his brother? It was obscene. Aye, indeed. The elders have met. The council has rendered a verdict that will satisfy both the McNaughton's need for restitution and your own need for a bride. You don't mean... The idea was so despicable he could not complete it. Surely they did not expect... They did. Aye, answered the old man, nodding his regal head. The McNaughtons will offer up one of their own. A fine, strong, healthy lass, a virgin. She'll be true to you and bear you a strong lad to carry on your brother's name and your own. In this way, they both sacrifice one of their own to replace that which you've lost and satisfy the Tanist's terms of succession. Rage as he might, ultimately, Nairn had no choice. The elders had spoken. The Council of Clans had rendered their edict. No man, Tanist or not, could stand against the Council. One grey, stormy day, he stood in the sacred meadow next to the selfsame elder, waiting on his McNaughton bride. Spear in hand, hair bound back, wearing his best kilt and plaid, he looked a fierce bridegroom from a warrior clan. He meant to. Whoever the lass was, he hoped to intimidate her from the start. Aye, he would marry her, but he needn't befriend her, love her, use her in any way except that which the elders in council prescribed, bluntly, as a brood mare. Across the way, through the gap between Brannock and Brinnock's crags, guardians of his clan lands, a red horse emerged. The wind kicked up a frightful gust, and raindrops gushed from the skies as if to herald its arrival. Though he waited green eyes alert for an escort of some sort. None appeared. The horse advanced alone, bearing a single rider. Alas! As she approached, details clarified, and he saw she wore the blue, red, and silver tartan of the McNaughton clan. As she drew even nearer, he saw that she was older than he'd expected. Why, she must be three or four years past his own age, and considerably more composed. Her reddish mare drew to a halt before the pair of them. From atop her perch, she stared down into his face with sober, ancient brown eyes. Her hair was redder than her horse's coat, her cheeks dusted with freckles. She was short, plump, and not at all a beauty. They send me a scorned spinster in place of a sprightly beauty? 
That's the McNaughton Redemption Price? They offer me this plain-faced lass in place of my bra brother? Tis revenge they're seeking, that's what. At the same time, Nairn knew he was being unfair. Earlier, he had loathed the idea of a frightened youngling, obliged to do her duty. So they sent him a remarkably poised woman instead of a chit. Yet he wasn't satisfied with her. Course I'm not, he told himself, even as the girl, without a word, slid nimbly from her perch and pushed past her horse, making her way to stand with him before the elder. She's a McNaughton, isn't she? Whatever else she was, his new bride, Marlana, was certainly quiet. During the wedding, she stared up gravely into his eyes. Her hands trembled not as they lay in his, nor did her voice as she lilted through her vows. Beauty or not, she possessed a soft, rhythmic voice, low for a woman, that was so pleasing it set his teeth on edge. Nairn wanted nothing to do with her, much less mind anything about her appealing. Following the final wedding blessing, he lifted her onto the back of her red mare, leaping up lightly after her. If she was discomfited by his close proximity, his arm around her waist, she did not betray it. If she were anxious at what was to follow when he led the way into his bedchamber, she held that secret as well. Nairn was unsure whether to be annoyed or pleased at her steadfastness. Selfishly, he'd hoped this part of the ordeal would be as distasteful to the McNaughton sacrifice as it was to him. But, clearly, it wasn't. She accepted his attentions with graceful tolerance, and afterward lay serenely on his bed, flaming hair spread across his pillow, and went to sleep. As for Nairn, he was left with a vague sense of disquiet. No woman in her position should accept a stranger so easily. Didn't she know what her clan had done? Shouldn't she fear him a wee bit, knowing how he hated her people and, by extension, her? Therein lay the rub. Hating quiet, enigmatic Marlana was an impossibility, as he fast discovered. She cleaned his halls, she cooked his meals, she washed and mended his plaids, she scraped the mud from his boots, and all without a word of complaint. When he wanted her, she was calm in her concurrence. If Nairn didn't find himself precisely making love to his wife, he found that lying with her was no unpleasant chore. As the days passed, she became a quiet, steady fixture in his household, in his heart. She could not take Niall's place. Of course, she was not meant to. Yet, grudgingly, he admitted she was as fine a wife as a man was like to get, except for the fact that she'd not yet done her duty and conceived. Aside from this, he'd no complaints. Nothing he said or did, even to the public and violent berating of her clan, could ruffle her. When one evening he inquired why, she looked back solemnly, then turned those ancient eyes towards the distant crags. I've not much time in your world. She answered in that slow, lilting way of hers. I would make the most of what I have, not waste it in anger and sorrow. What do you mean by that? He demanded, suspicious, slamming his tankard down on the table. Are you planning to leave me? Gravely, she turned back to him. I was never long for this world. One day, I shall have to go. You can't go? He growled, thrusting back the chair and rising to his feet. You're my wife! Or have you forgotten? The smile on her lips was sad, knowing. It brought prickly facts to mind, such as his repeated avowals that he didn't want her here. Furthermore, it told him she could see inside, knew him better than he knew himself, knew she'd somehow made herself, if not indispensable, then at least something of a solace, harsh assertions to the contrary notwithstanding. Chagrined, Nairn sunk back down in his chair. Grasping the tankard, he took a long pull of the ale, turning away, unable to bear looking at her. Nevertheless, her mysterious eyes, filled with ageless secrets, never left him. He could feel their pull now and wherever he went. It was a pull strong enough to tug a man in, make him want to lose himself in the consolation she offered. Nairn knew the truth for real when he wakened in the middle of the night, haunted by nightmares of his lost brother, reaching for the comfort of her arms. When he felt no warm, soft body beside him, discovered her absence, panic stabbed his heart. 
panic akin to that he'd felt when Nial first went missing. Marlana! He hissed into the darkness, the sweat slicking his naked chest and back turning cold. Marlana! Where are you? In his ears rang her words. I was never long for this world. One day I shall have to go. Had she gone? Was she lost to him? Already? It can't be! He swore, throwing back the coverlets and bounding out of bed, finding his clothing and weapons by moonlight. Nay, she can't have left me. She can't be lost to me. I'll not permit it. Outside, into the bright night, he fled. Through mud churned up by Evenfall's rain, her tracks were simple for his hunter's eyes to follow. Yet, even as he crouched low, speeding through the eerily silent village and into the encompassing forest, he sensed the oddness, the reverence of this night. Something was wrong. The night was much too bright. No moon shone, yet this night was clear as though the full moon captained her lily galleon across seas of stars. In the forest, trees whispered at his passing, branches reaching out, not to hinder, but to playfully slap his bare arms, kissing his fingertips and boots. Vines slithered along his heels, not to trip, but to... Shamin's glory! They're leading the way! He swore, awestruck. Shadows danced and played around his speeding form. Somewhere in the distance, a wolf howled. Not a lonely or threatening sound, but the happy cry of mate to mate. Does she do this? Mysteries lurked in those somber eyes, mysterious, ageless, and deep as the forest around him. A forest that led him on, even when her tracks were lost by the carpet of fallen leaves and thick, springy velvet moss. Vines slithered ahead, flowers bent in the direction she'd passed, squirrels leapt from limb to limb overhead, chattering directions. This is the way. Come this way. Lost, a man in a dream, ensorcelled by the she night around him, Nairn sped on until... The vines halted. The flowers stood upright. The squirrels ceased chattering. In an instant, all the world was hushed. A sly, soft wind, caressing as his lady's hands, breathed over his skin. This way, it coaxed. This way, this way. Nairn obeyed, allowing himself to be tugged along until... Marlana. There she was. His heart hurtled in his chest. Yet when he would have rushed to gather his bride into his arms... The wind held him still. Watch, it bade. Watch, heed, observe. Morphed to ice, the highland man obeyed, sinking to his bare knees in the wet grass at the edge of the clearing, his kilt spreading around him. Lay down your sword, whispered the wind. He comes, he comes. He comes? Who comes? Even as he inquired... Out of the depths glided a creature of silver, shadow, and gold. In an instant, Nairn understood the night's queer brightness echoed the luminescence of this creature, strange as it sounded. His heart pounding, his fingers yet clenching the sword he'd laid in the grass, he observed as the creature drifted over the meadow towards his wife. Why dost thou linger? Forgive me, Majesty, entreated Marlana, prostrating herself on the grass before him. The time is not yet right. My purpose has not been fulfilled. What purpose wouldst thou fulfill, my child? inquired the Shining One, laying a translucent hand on Marlana's scarlet hair. Thou sought the life of a mortal, wishing to atone for sins not thine own. I granted thy request, though I did not understand it. Pray tell me, Lady of the Crags, why loiter thee with mortals when thy place is with us? My place is here, Majesty, answered Marlana, her voice muffled to Nairn's straining ears. The mortal one was lured to death in my realm. I ought to have saved him. I could not. I must now make amends as best I can. How wilt thou make amends? The world of man is ever full of discord. Marlana? Here the creature paused, sighed, as if in great sorrow. Oh, these highland men are bringers of strife. We know that. 
thou of all knowest it best. I say to thee that thy time among them is squandered. Surrender thy quest. I beg your pardon, Majesty. I cannot. Fully aware am I of the nature of the Highland men. Strife bringers they are, yet I serve the balance. When something is lost... Another thing must be found. <sighs> Again the Shining One sighed. Well, and mayhap thou art right. Go there, go to thy mortal man. Restore that which was lost, then come again to our world. Majesty, I hear and obey. We will not meet again, not until this business has been concluded. No, Majesty. Serve the balance, my child. Serve the balance, Marlana echoed. The Shining One made as if to withdraw. Yet, as he did, pupilless eyes of golden fire glanced up, marking the spot Nairn lay. Infidel, he hissed. Fear squeezing his heart in two, the watching warrior leapt up to flee, and the world went black. for real the day he was riding Stormcrest back from a visit to his uncle Idgar, the clan chief. There, blooming wild betwixt scattered boulders, were scarlet roses. Espying them, he pulled his mount to a halt. The flaming color, red as Niall's scarlet eagle and Marlana's red hair, pulled his thoughts to his wife. Before stopping to heed his actions, he leapt off the horse's back and tromped through the weeds and stickers that plucked at his kilt to gather a thorny bouquet. It was the first time ever in his twenty years that he'd brought flowers to a lass, much less a gift to a McNaughton. That day he knew the truth for real was the day Nairn surprised Marlana at her washing. Staring off towards the twin crags, a wistful gleam in her ancient brown eyes. That was the day he stretched forth a rough, muddy hand, suddenly shy of his blunt, calloused fingers and his meager offering. Half the petals had fallen from the flowers, and already the stems were drooping. It was the day Marlana glanced up into his face, with something akin to surprise, rather than her customary, eloquent self-assurance. For me? For you, he replied, half fearing she'd forbear to take them. The day Nairn knew the truth was the day pink stole into her cheeks and her strong, wee hands lifted to take the flowers from his. A smile of pure, feminine pleasure on her lips. She buried her nose in the blossoms, breathing deep. Dark, curling lashes lifted, and for the second time, something besides old knowledge was in those brown eyes. In fact, that day ne'er knew the truth was the day those eyes glinted a sly, wicked invitation. Compelled, lost, he took a step forward, and she more than met him halfway. His mind scarcely had time to appreciate that she was in his arms before she was, and her mouth was being raised for a kiss. Willingly, he complied, and the day he kissed her, truly kissed her for the first time, was the same day he truly made love to her for the first time, which was the same day she conceived. later, weeks long enough for the mound housing his child to noticeably swell, he lay with his head on her stomach, attempting to hear the baby's heartbeat or feel the subtle stirring she now felt as it swam in her womb. I think it is too early yet, Marlana admonished with gentle humor. Quiet, you, he growled back, pressing his ear a little tighter against her bare belly. <laughs> his wife laughed, ran a caressing hand through his unbound hair. I've barely felt the stirrings myself. She reminded him. I've been us some months yet till time. Do you mean to talk or do you mean to let me try? He demanded with a mock glare. Hold your tongue, lass. Let the child have a chance to know his dad is near. As you say, husband. Marlana yielded, a twinkle in those otherwise grave eyes. Try your best. You'll not get a word from me. She kept that promise. 
for about ten breaths. Then... Nairn? Nairn, releasing a heavy sigh, gave up the fight and rose. <sighs> what is it, lass? Her features in the darkened bedchamber were shadowy, but for the first time since he'd known her, his unflappable McNaughton bride appeared anxious. Nairn, you are... You are truly pleased with the child, are you not? Pleased? He chuckled. Alas, have I given you cause to believe I'm not but pleased? Grinning, he rolled over, pulling her fully into his arms and sliding down on the mattress. In fact, I'll be happy to show you again if that's what you want. But she braced a hand against his chest, forestalling him. Nairn, please. This is very important. You must listen closely to what I have to say. Taken aback, he retreated slightly. What is it, little sprite? The hand on his chest shifted, both it and its mate reaching to cup his face. Hold him still. Nairn, Marlana whispered, voice rough as if from restrained passion. If you could be given just one perfect gift, your heart's true desire, what would it be? Instantly, flashes seeped into his brain. Silver, gold, shadows, fine slithering, flowers bending. Voices. I must now make amends as best I can. How wilt thou make amends? Disoriented, he shook his head to chase them away. A dream, doubtless. A bewitched Swevin. Or so Marlana had claimed when he wakened in sweaty terror some months back, crying out, The Shining One is coming! The Shining One will smite me! The Shining One! The Shining One! Forcing a smile to his lips, he chided, my one true desire? I have you, lass, and your babe. What more could I want? What about... She hesitated. Your brother? Your lost brother? Would you want him back? Nairn felt his blood freeze. I... I... He stammered. I'd want Niall back, so I would. At any cost? Marlana prompted. I... The more he thought on it... The fiercer grew the ache in his chest. Aye, at any cost, he stated with growing conviction. Any, I'd do anything, give anything, to have my brother back as he used to be, before the Mac Norton stole him away. From that day on, his quiet, complacent Marlana changed. Not outright, but in strange, subtle ways. She clung a little tighter, kissed a little sweeter, embraced a little fiercer. She spent great amounts of time laying up provisions, cleaning his halls, and stitching new plaids and kilts. Nairn marked it as her mothering instincts. She wished everything to be in readiness for the babe. Yet strangely, all of her work for the babe, for him, was accomplished with a withdrawn, distant deportment. Every night, she lay close to him, as if fearful to let him go. There were times Nairn felt he suffocated, but she was building his child, after all. Weren't women apt to act strangely while caring? He did his best to have patience with her, when before it was always she needing to be patient with him. One night, she lay against him, her head on his shoulder, and whispered, I wish it could always be so. Daft. It can, he replied sleepily. Nay, nay, tis all a beautiful dream, one from which I must soon awaken. Her comment was strange, but she'd made stranger. Passing it off, yet again, to her expectancy, he mumbled sleepily. If tis a dream, then may wake me. I should like to sleep forever. One cannot dream forever. She murmured sadly. One cannot remain lost for always. Some day one must emerge from the shadows into the broad light of day. Mm. And yet sometimes being lost feels very pleasant. I could merely stay lost forever. Could you? Could you, Nair? Abruptly, she sat up, her flaming hair spilling about her shoulders. I... That I could. Drowsily, he reached for her, pulling her down onto his chest and smoothing tangled hair from her face. If being lost could keep me from nay knowing what losing you is like, then I, I could. 
Nan? Is this love? She whispered after a lingering silence. The hand caressing her hair stilled as the question penetrated, driving away sleep's fog. If not, he answered at last, I'll scream with frustration, for it very much feels like love. Which was the last thing he'd expected he would say to a McNaughton. The babe was born not two weeks later. Away on clan business, he trotted up to his home to find a cluster of women about his door. The sound of a babe's cry came from within. Nobody had to tell him a thing. Leaping from Stormcrest's back, he plunged into the house, racing to Marlana, to his newborn son. was three weeks old when his father woke to find Marlana gone. Assuming she was up with the child, he didn't panic. Not, that is, until he waited a space, and she never returned. Alarmed, he rose and stumbled his way to the crib in the corner of the room. There lay his firstborn son, bearing his brother's name, sleeping peacefully as only infants can. The child's mother was nowhere to be seen. Lighting a taper, he searched the dwelling, fighting down the panic that twisted his guts. When Marlana continued unfound, he fetched a neighbor woman to stay with the bairn, then, refusing explanations, set out in search. Nature afforded no helping hand. Marlana's tracks were difficult to locate, harder still to follow. Dawn was breaking in riotous splashes of color by the time he pulled a weary storm crest to a halt at the foot of looming Branick's crag. Here, her footsteps vanished. Had she surmounted the cliff? Without hesitation, he leapt from horse to ground and followed suit. T'was no easy climb. His plaid and kilt snagged repeatedly. His bare knees were scraped and bloodied. His clumsy boots fought for purchase. Nevertheless, at last he was atop the crag, standing in the dawn itself. Below were his clan lands, spreading vast and fruitful beneath him. Before him was Brennick's twin, Brinnick, and wheeling towards him on a morning breeze, a scarlet eagle. Transfixed, the highland man temporarily forgot fear over his lost wife, arrested as the eagle soared nearer and nearer. A cold dawn breeze heralded her advance. She was huge, large as storm crest below. Fierce, wild, proud. Her silver head stood in sharp contrast to her scarlet feathers. Her beak and talons were gold, her eyes a deep, gentle brown. Marlana! Just as the eagle nigh brushed the crag with its wings, from behind a boulder emerged his bride of a year. Her simple nightdress altered into a sheer gown of silvery white, her scarlet hair red as the bird, her eyes the same deep, gentle brown. She glided towards the edge of the cliff. Just as she reached it, the sun peeked over the rim of the eastern mountains, splashing the world with scarlet and gold. At this point she turned, stealing Nairn's breath. Brilliant beauty, breathtaking pulses of silver-golden shadow beneath her skin, a pair of gossamer wings sprouting from her back. Who was this creature? Surely not the plain, plump, freckled lass he'd wed. Her eyes closed the distance between them. Farewell, Nairn, she said, sadness in her voice, on her face. Her eyes, however, were calm, quiet, and ancient, holding mystery upon mystery. Your brother is no longer lost to you. And giving you a son with his name, I have returned his spirit, his essence. Your brother will live, and I must depart. Had he swallowed his tongue? The warrior could not speak, could only plead with his eyes. Marlana, nay, stay with me. Reading his thoughts, or interpreting the plea, she shook her head solemnly. I cannot, Nairn. You loved me, but I was nay your deepest desire. Happy as I was being lost with you, I was not the one you most wanted. So I must go. Your deepest wish has been fulfilled, that which you said you'd surrender anything to attain. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I knew not what you were asking. Yes, you did, she whispered back, 
inside his head. And truly, mortal man, would you have it any different? His mind sketched an image of his son, carrying his brother's name and essence. Memories flooded of his brother, himself, as younglings, lads and warriors. Niall returned to him, his brother, his son. Agony ripped him in two. At last he found his voice. Marlana, not at this cost, he croaked, stumbling a step forward, arms outstretched. I serve the balance, she answered, grieved. I have paid the price for sins not my own. I have restored that which was lost. From great sorrow comes great joy, and so it shall be for you, my love. One day my memory will be lost to you. You will find happiness in your son, in a mortal woman of your own clan, and you will be at peace. You lie, he wanted to shout. Naught could make me forget you. Nothing can heal the hurt if you leave. Oddly, both body and tongue were frozen. Marlana knew it. Raising a hand, she pressed her fingertips to her lips, then sent a soft wind to blow the kiss his way. For an aching, bittersweet instant, he felt her mouth against his own, tasted her lips. Farewell, child of man. May your sorrows be few and your joys many. May your days be pleasant and your nights pleasure. Don't leave me, lass. She ignored the mute cry. And thank you. Thank you, my love. Though you may forget Marlana, Ashente, Lady of the Craigs, will never forget you. With that, she drifted backwards towards the edge of the cliff. One step, two. Nairn's heart leapt to his throat. Did she mean to jump? cast herself to her death? Would those flimsy wings support her in the stiff breezes swirling about the crags? He'd forgotten the eagle. One dainty, bare foot stepped off the edge and into space, and there was the eagle. With a scream to rend the earth, the giant bird caught up Marlana, a shente on her back, bearing her away and into the sun on wings of blood. Released from her spell, Nairn dropped to his knees, arms wrapped around his gaping chest. Through eyes blurred by tears, he watched his brother's eagle bear his bride away, watched until both of them melted with the sun and were forever lost from view. Awakened from a sound sleep, a child bearing the name of one once lost opened eyes of black, Black as the uncle whose name he carried. Black eyes, but ancient too. Ancient and sober, holding secret upon secret, riddle upon riddle, mystery upon mystery. Author's note. The story you have just heard, Lost, was inspired by country star Faith Hill's beautiful song of the same title, a particular favorite of Sarah's. While elements of romance in the story were inspired by Hill's ballad, the character's semi-Scottish setting and all fantasy elements are decidedly Ashwood's own. Sarah hopes you enjoyed this story of self-sacrifice and finding love in unusual places. Working for nub in all the wrong paces. Working for nub. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed today's story. Dead on the dad is that. Did it, David, dad. Warning today's episode contains singing. Parental discretion is advised. Hey, you said you were going to make sure that, that happened at the start. Oh. That was your resolution. But we're barely a month into the year, and you've already blown your. Was that your only resolution, or did you have another one? I don't remember. It was being... my only resolution, but I'm going to blame announcer man for not it, coming in at the very beginning. That's true. It is his job, after all. Uh, huh? <laughs> Forget it. Of course, he's not real. I mean... You're mocking me, aren't you? No, 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 no,
Wook and Penub. Sorry, we're done with that. All right, great. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for sending us this story. Now, yeah. uh, unless I'm mistaken. Which you usually are. That's fair. But if I break with tradition and I'm not mistaken, <laughs> this is a story that you set aside for a particular holiday, one I will not mention. I did. Do you want me to mention it or should I just let people infer on their own? Is that the right word, infer? We were just talking oh, about no. that today. Infer, imply. But, but just, just a second. <laughs> According to Webster's online 2005 dictionary, infer is defined as who gives a rat's ass. Oh, right. We kind of mentioned this last year belatedly. Once it was too late to do anything about it, we realized that the stories that we ran right after Valentine's Day was over would have been perfect Valentine's Day stories. I think we ran the first Clob story like the end of February. And then we ran Mars in His Hand that was also would have been great as a Valentine's Day story. Not that we need to theme our show up or whatever, but, you know, when October came around, we spent the entire month being sure to do scary stories. So I thought it'd be cool to give that a shot this year. And so we have a couple stories that we've been saving almost a year. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. <laughs> well, I guess that's what happens with every story that we do these days. But we've been saving it up for a while just because, you know, I thought it would be a, a really nice uh, Valentine's type story. It would be cool to run several of them together. So we have actually three valentine's day stories that we're going to run this is the first of them and we've got a couple more in the weeks to come if there are people listening who don't like valentine's day is there anything you can do for them i think i hear your mama calling you rich please it just so happens that i've kept them in mind too i think there's a term for the type of grin that's on your face right now <laughs> warning today's episode contains uh, stay out of the room we're not going to say it announcer man <laughs> okay. uh yeah, it so happens that we also have a story like that. I figured, you know, a lot of people get irritated when Valentine's Day comes around. They just want all the stupid people with their fluffy pink hearts and their teddy bears holding I love you pillows to die. Yes, so, yes, they do. So I went ahead and set aside an anti-Valentine's Day story, too. I read this story a little while ago, and I just thought, wow, it just won me over. I don't know. There was something just so refreshingly bitter about that story that uh, I think it'll be fun when we get to that. But that's not today's story. Today's story was lost. <laughs> no, no, the episode was lost. Oh, right, right. But I'm sorry. I'm never going to let you live that down. <laughs> we sat here for an hour or yeah. whatever, and uh, you went to save. I, no, what did you you go to do? You went. I think I went to check on a movie title or something. So I popped over to the internet to look up IMDb, and bam, that just switching those programs hit my computer like a sledgehammer in the face and it toppled okay well just I preemptively think... waking ned divine all right <laughs> right that was it hopefully that line of conversation doesn't come up again <laughs> um so yeah this story was an interesting one it, you could say it was a bit of a gamble on our part i think I don't know about a gamble, a, 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 a stretch, a bit of a leap of faith, a well, bit of a okay, challenge. I was, I was just going to say we kind of opened ourselves up for some criticism. Because this is not a bunch of Americans sitting around talking. This is a story set in medieval Scotland. And uh, I thought that the story was cool enough that it was worth going for all the same, even if we might mangle it. And I'm pretty sure that it was my Scottish accent that was once referred to in a comment somewhere on the internet as being Dick Van Dyke level awful. Okay, but to be fair... I'm on the line just as much as you are in this story. True. We're not doing a funny voice meant to be comical. <laughs> right. So if it does sound like a bad accent, it's like, <laughs> well, he's an, an imaginary pig, so it doesn't yeah. matter. A lot of the impact of this story relies on taking it seriously. True. And so, yeah, when I first read it, I thought, I don't know if we're up to this. This is going to be a challenge, and if we <laughs> screw it up, people are going to make fun of us. I, I don't mind uh, when, when you make fun of me. I kind of don't mind when the friggin' robot makes fun of me. 
You know what I mean? I But we did try we our did. level best on this thing. Unfortunately, I think I did a much better job with my Scottish accent doing the girls' lines, which, of course, we cut out because we once long ago swore to never... Unless it's a creepy old woman's voice, you know, we're not going to do the girls' voices. Because it's just too hard to take something like that seriously, in my opinion. So, the good job that I did with the accent is completely excised from the story. No, 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 like, excision was last week. I, I still don't know what that word means. Right. Completely excised from the story. And, uh... My weaker accent is the one that still remains. But again, like I said, I, I think the story was strong enough and worth it that maybe here and there people go, oh, jeez, and they'll roll their eyes when they hear me talk. But for the most part, I think, you know, they'll just enjoy the story. Well, let's just say that and move on. If you did have a big problem with it, I, I'm sorry. We honestly tried it as hard as we could. <laughs> and uh, if it was beyond our ability... It's always best to try, to stretch, to go somewhere that's uncomfortable, to grow, yeah. than to stay within your comfort zone, even if you fail, I because so you too. tried. And uh, if this worked, then maybe we'll continue to do that, yeah. and we'll try. I, I mean, I know that uh, our accents aren't perfect, yeah. but, uh, you know, neither is Anthony friggin' Hopkins. Is. And, right, and he we is, talked about is, that. He's an Oscar-winning thespian. He's that's right. Sir he's Anthony a Hopkins. sir. He's a knight. And hey, if you're a Scottish person and you want to do voices for us, get in contact with us and maybe we can give you some parts. Who knows? Yeah, we probably should have said that weeks ago. Yeah, well, you would have just said, no, I must do it myself because I love myself. Anyways, so. Yeah, that sort of undercut what we were just talking about. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know about you, but one of the things that really resonated with me on this story was... The ending, the, the idea that, that they could have been happy, they could have been together, everything could have worked out all right, but that the guy was flawed, that the guy made a mistake, that he said uh -huh. the wrong thing, and it all comes crashing down. And ultimately, I think she would have been content to stay as well. Yeah. Neither of them end up happy. Yeah, uh, she I, was making a test for him at the time that he didn't realize she was making a test, so he didn't really think about it, I think. It's a really kind of a tragic story. And those are the kind of romances I really, really like. Just the idea of the, I, I guess, the doomed romance. Maybe uh -huh. there's a better name for that, but doomed romance is two words, and you can't get much more specific than doomed yeah. romance, can you? Uh, I'm sure Abby knows one word that means doomed <laughs> romance. But yeah. uh, I'm not uh, impugning Abby. What? I'm not making fun of Abby. Oh. But, uh... I'm not taking the piss out of Abby. I'm just saying that she's really smart. Yeah, unlike us. Well, that goes without saying. You're rambling again, guys. I think we were talking about romantic comedies last week and how a lot of times they can be really predictable. And you know that the boy and the girl are going to end up together. And the fun is putting all these obstacles in front of them and seeing how they get around them. And there's something refreshing and realistic, in, in my experience, of course, about the two people that had a shot at happiness and somebody blew it or all the world stood in their way. Star-crossed lovers, you know, just <laughs> right. it was not meant to be. And I, I love that. I, I am much more impacted by Gwyneth Paltrow going to America and Ray Fiennes staying, and, and even though they'd like to be together, they can't. And uh, The one that comes to mind for me is, all, I'm not sure why it makes such an impression, but Chasing Amy is that same kind of a thing, where at the end, it just doesn't work out for some reason, even though they really love each other, and you know, they walk away sad, they just know it's not going to work. You know, that one was a lot closer to Lost, because yeah. it was not Joey Lauren Adams' fault. It was... Uh, Holden McNeil, I still remember his name. It was Ben Affleck's <laughs> fault, totally. You know, that, that he had the chance yeah, yeah. for love, and it slipped through his fingers. But you know, it's funny because not that many come to mind. It's it's something that doesn't come up all that often, I guess. The ones that do come to mind seem to be pretty powerful, resonating kind of stories. We as audiences, not just as Americans. Everybody wants there to be a happy ending, and they want the boy and the girl to fall in love. They, they want a fantasy. They want to imagine that this could happen to them. Mm -hmm. And they take the girl in their arms, and everything works out. And their dreams come true. Because so often, your dreams just flop around on the ground until they run out of air, and then they turn hard and smell. 
Yeah. Wait, okay. Once again, the, uh, me I'm talking about. Uh, probably the most obvious example of the doomed romance is Romeo and Juliet. Right. That's, what, four or five hundred years old, and it's still, it's still powerful. Mm-hmm. Now, I remember when we were in school, the drama society or the school decided to put on Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, I think they did at least one Shakespeare play every year. Probably all schools do. Probably, yeah. And uh, I went to it, and the director, <laughs> this is the weirdest thing, and it, 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 it made a big impact on me, probably in a negative way, but he had decided that he was going to give us his take on Romeo and Juliet. And that take was that because these were 12 or 13-year-old kids, uh-huh. they didn't really know what love was. It was just some kind of hormonal infatuation, you know, some childish, silly, impulsive thing that these two brats did, (laughs) and it destroys their lives. And he wanted to show that these were dumb a-holes. I mean, he said it right there in the playbook, or what what do you call that? Is it the program? Program, right. He said it right there that that was the take that he wanted to to make. That, that, That was the way that he wanted to tell the story. So he cast like a really, really young looking girl, still had her baby fat and all that. And still had her baby teeth, for that matter, it was weird. It's a seven year old girl, which I thought was really strange because Romeo was played by a 45 year old. No, I, I apologize. But anyhow, this was the reason he wanted to tell the story. And I had never seen Romeo and Juliet. You know, there's not a heck of a lot of opportunities unless you go to a Shakespeare festival right, or, or you happen to put it on in your school. And so I was a little bit upset by this. But even so, even with his attempts to <laughs> fuck up this story, I was bawling during the, you know, oh, true apothecary. Uh, apothecary? That word. And the, the the dagger and scene. I was just, it was one of those where I was like... <laughs> And I looked around and other people were crying too. It was just so timeless and so powerful that even though it should have been like, oh, you kids are stupid. You deserve to die, Jamie Lee Curtis. I was totally moved, totally energized by this experience and, you know, clapping and crying when everybody got up and there never was a story of more woe than Juliet Uh and her Romeo. Oh my gosh. And that's the only time I've ever seen the play. And yeah, well, I guess I have a story about it. I guess so. You can keep talking. I'll interrupt you when I give a crap. Oh, you shit. Oh, by the way, this is our all profanity episode. I just wanted you to know. Warning. Today's episode contains themes and language that is unsuitable for children or educated peoples. And and, and, and the, like the next year, we were in some class. It was a film class. And uh-huh. they decided to show us a filmic adaptation of it. And the one that they chose was Baz Luhrmann's Romeo plus Juliet, the one with, with Claire Danes and Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, no! We're going to have to hear the effing Cardigan song. <laughs> I don't want to see this. You know, it's like, oh, because I, oh, that was like kryptonite to me. I remember seeing the commercials and the trailers and, oh, I want nothing to do with this, sir. And they brought it in. And they forced us to sit down and watch it. They tied my arms behind my back and uh-huh. didn't even give me a cigarette. Pride opened my eyes, you know, Clockwork Orange style. And, dude, I was bawling during that as well. Yeah, you know, that's probably the first time that I ever saw Romeo and Juliet as well was on that film. I saw that when it came out in the theaters, unlike you, who had to be tied down. And Yeah, I had a girlfriend uh, at the time who was... Horny as hell. That's beside the point. You can tell I got some caffeine in me today. (laughs) But uh, she loved that film. She loved the Cardigan song. She loved everything about that film. And she saw that and she's like, oh, you have to come see this with me. And she made me go to the Dollar Theater. I think it was already in by that time. And we may well have been the only motherfuckers in the theater on that day. All cursing episode, ladies and gentlemen. It must have been like the very, very end of its run. Because I swear, I think we were the only two people in the entire theater. It was a special screening just for us. and uh, A yeah. special pants-free screening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hey, man, if you got it, flaunt it. Yeah, so she told me ahead of time, she's like, okay, then just bear with it to begin with because it's going to freak you out, but then you'll get used to it. And that was totally the case because that movie comes on and, you know, it's Shakespeare. It's supposed to be 
Shakespearean, but instead <laughs> it was definitely not. It was a crazy film. I and mean, it's Baz Luhrmann, so if you've seen any Baz Luhrmann film, you know it's going to be a little wacky. I didn't realize, because I'd seen Strictly Ballroom before, I didn't realize it was the same director, but that movie was a little wacky too. Yeah, Romeo and Juliet starts up and they have what would be the opening sword fight scene in a Shakespearean production. But yeah, they're whipping out their guns, but they're calling them their rapiers or their broadswords or whatever. And, you know, exploding gas pumps. And they're doing all the crazy stuff. This was pretty early in the uh, development of this kind of stuff. I mean, they didn't do ramping of uh, the film speeds and that kind of stuff very much before this film. I mean, that was something that was limited maybe to music videos, and even then it was still a new thing. And they kept using that all over the place, and it was like somebody had brought out some crazy toy that, you know, lights up and spins and flies and bounces around, and they set that thing all off at once, off at the start of that film. And then, at a certain point, it kind of settles down, and they stop hitting you over the head with that. Although, to tell you the truth, I was a film geek at the time, so I ate that stuff up. I was just like, oh, that's cool. I love that. So even then, I didn't mind, although it wasn't what I was expecting. But yeah, it settles down. And yeah, it was the same thing. I was bawling when it got to the end of that movie. It was so good. Had Leonardo DiCaprio in it. And at the time, he hadn't done Titanic, so his name had not become a hiss and a byword among people who have learned to despise him. He hadn't become the teenage girl's dream and everybody else's nightmare kind of a thing yet so actually i was a big fan of claire danes for years after that movie because of thought she was so great in that film unfortunately it didn't go anywhere but uh yeah I, there's some serious power in that in that story of romeo and juliet and just in that idea of the star-crossed lovers, the doomed lovers, that through no fault of their own, there's just no way that they can be happy. It's just going to be woeful. There's got to be room for both kinds of stories. The, yeah. And he took, and he her, took in her in his, his arms, 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 kind of romance. And, and, she, and died. she died. <laughs> kind of romance, yeah. <laughs> I like that. I, I suppose the next couple of weeks we'll have other kinds of romance and we'll... We've got some odd romance coming up next week, so be prepared. I don't know how to prepare myself, but I'll be here. Oh, okay. And, and as far as this story goes, I, I fantasy? Romantic fantasy? Fiction! It was fiction. Ah. Yeah, it, it fits in those categories of uh, romance and fantasy. You know, maybe it's just Americans that feel this way, but yeah, the setting of this story being set in medieval scotland being set in the the pastoral areas of the uh, united kingdom and there's something about it it happens a lot where they romanticize that sort of a setting scotland ireland as well they, they get that same kind of uh, romanticization there is something mythically magically romantic about those places probably even today in the 21st century people and you know i don't i don't imagine it's just americans i'll bet even people in england think of those two countries to the north as as some kind of otherworldly place you know or stonehenge and leprechauns and immortal guys in kilts plus every movie that we've ever seen it's just so beautiful there. Yeah. And I know that that, at least for as far as Scotland goes, that's not entirely typical. <laughs> but we just have this image of just these awesome crags and green fields. Yeah. And it's interesting. That's one of the places that my wife actually would love to visit. But it's not Scotland necessarily she wants to visit. She wants to visit Ireland a lot. She has this idyllic view of it being this I think we all do. I think it comes from like a lot of the movies that have been done out of Ireland. There's like Far and Away and there's... Uh, Gotta be O'Gill and the Little People. Maybe was, that's just me. And and like the one movie that really comes to mind recently, and I don't know how recent that really counts to be anymore. I'm, I'm getting old and getting old fast. And so it seems like it was recent, but it was Waking Ned Divine, which was uh, another one that was set in the Irish countryside. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, we had Leap Year that came out with Amy Adams. I mean, yeah, it didn't last long in the theaters, mm. don't worry. <clears throat> but, doesn't uh, sound familiar. It was a magical, romantic 
story, and it was to it was set in Ireland. Huh, cool. I like Amy Adams. Okay. My wife tried to get me to watch Julie and, Julie and Julia, and then, of course, she promptly fell asleep, and so I turned it off, and I said, forget it. And then the next day, she's like, so do you want to watch that now with me? I was like, no, you had your chance. You had your chance. You get one chance, you fall asleep on me, and that's it. Hmm. Listener discretion is advised. Anyways, that was aside from the point. But yeah, my wife would actually like to go and visit that place. And the funny thing is, she wants to go to Ireland, but her ancestry is Scottish. But she's not really interested in Scotland. Maybe it's because she saw Braveheart. Did she fall asleep during that? Oh, probably. Although, to tell you the truth, even Braveheart is really, really beautiful. But it's also very, very violent. So maybe she's just afraid that she's going to get an arrow in her buttock like that one guy that was mooning the English. <laughs> you know, Big, someday we will all have arrows in our buttocks. Good, good. I mean, do we have anything like that in America? A place that's romanticized that everybody's like, wow, the, the anything can happen in Baltimore. Like, oh, it's a magical place. Everyone must make a journey to Little Rock someday. I wouldn't say Baltimore is the place, although Baltimore, I'm sure, has its own charms. I don't know what they are, but I'm sure it has them. You could probably say that the Old West, that the West is kind of romanticized in a similar way, you know? It's, okay. It's that time period that, A, they've made a bazillion movies about. They, they look back on that kind of period of the cowboy and the... But innocent. there's nothing magical. No, there's it's not no, magical. I mean, I'm sorry, but there's no magical place in America. I don't think there's a magical place, no. Unless maybe, oh, New Orleans, ah, you could okay. say maybe is a place like that. That That's our equivalent. That's the romantic in a... It's got history. It's got atmosphere. Yeah. It's got voodoo. Yeah, it's got voodoo. It's got Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras, there you go. You know, in another place that you might romant is a romanticize, it's probably not a magical place either, but a place that endlessly romanticizes is just New York City. Something about that and how it is that 80% of movies are somehow all happen in New York City. What it is about that place. Why doesn't Baltimore get more movies? I don't know. Wasn't the chick from Sleepless in <coughs> Seattle in Baltimore when he was in Seattle? And yet they still ended up meeting in New York City. I'm sure I don't know. I guess it makes sense to mention it because it was one of the previews on Julie and Julie, Julie and Julia. Was Nora Ephron the director of Sleepless in Seattle? Because she was also the Julie and Julia director. Yeah, I, for some reason they had like trailers for every Nora Ephron movie or something like that. They had that one and then they also did uh, this awful hanging up film. I wanted to hang myself up just watching the preview. It was enough. Yeah, that's so that's why the Baltimore thing came to mind because I'm pretty sure they showed that quote in that trailer. Which why would they do a bunch of trailers for old movies? Were they suddenly re-releasing them or? They have, yeah, they may have like a Nora Ephron collection that they've got a little border on each of the DVDs. <laughs> they do that a lot now. I used to do yeah. it with cassettes, but with DVDs, it's so much cheaper. There is no way that we're going to go to New York to meet some woman who could be a crazed psychopath. Didn't you see Fatal Attraction? Well, I saw it, and it scared the shit out of me. It scared the shit out of every man in America. I, I take it you've seen that movie before. No. I came to As opposed entry. to uh, Hanging Up, which who, is a good thing. Cause who was it? No, was that Diane Keaton and Meg Diane Ryan? Diane Keaton, Meg Ryan, Lisa Kudrow. Lucky as numbers, sisters. sisters. Really? Now, how can Diane Keaton be sisters with Lisa, sisters Kudrow. With Lisa Kudrow and Meg Ryan? Now, Meg Ryan is right in the middle, right? Doesn't look that old, but, she, I mean, doesn't. She does now. Meg Ryan isn't that young, but she doesn't look that old either. You know what I mean? It just really didn't fit. Probably yeah, you know, if Sarah Ashwood had written Hanging Up, I think it'd probably be yeah, worth it. Yeah, would be a lot better. See what I did there? I tried to bring the conversation Ooh, good back. job. I liked this story. I, we probably should run more stories that have love in them. Oh, uh, I don't know. I think we do a fair job. I think we have a number of stories that have stuff like that in them. Thank you, Sarah, for trusting us with your work. I hope that you think that we did all right. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Maybe just that kind of thing resonates with me, and, and, and if it resonates with anybody else, it's because everybody has had a near romance, a, a, the, the one that got away. Yeah. You know, everybody has had when a door seemed to open and then it closed, and you always wonder what might have happened had mm -hmm. that door opened up. Yeah, it just seems to resonate with pretty much everyone, I think, a little bit. And, yeah, I imagine even people as good-looking as you 
mm-hmm. had some girl that was killed in that plane crash that took Leonard Skinner. Yeah. Um, or whatever, you know what I mean? And was still has day? the one that got away. So, yeah, that was good stuff. <laughs> you know, sometimes on the show, and I think everybody is probably tempted to do this, the the fake yell. Where it's like, run, run, Toby, run. The, the whisper yell. Yeah. What? Hey, look out. And, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I hear that in other podcasts or audiobooks, and it just bothers me because nobody does that in real life. Right. And it always takes me out of a narrative, especially in, in podcasts where things are supposed to be acted. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you're just reading to a group of third graders, I can understand saying, the power was always in you, Tobias. I, does that bother you at all? A little bit, yeah. I prefer to just go ahead and let her rip, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> in more ways than one, folks. Uh, <laughs> but I totally know what you're feeling. Sometimes I feel bad, though, because a lot of times we're reading stories and we got to get to that point. And it's like late at night when we usually do this. And my wife, she's trying to sleep and has to work early in the morning. And here we are in there going, run, Tobias! And uh, yeah, you know, I wonder how much sleep she gets. Like a couple weeks ago, there was that time when we were reading a story and me and you are doing the thing. And then you get to that part where you're supposed to yell. And so you're yelling and going off. And then my wife comes in here and she's like, what's going on? We'd woken her up again. <laughs> Felt bad. But see, I, I get the impression she doesn't wake up. She's not bothered when you're yelling. It's just this strange voice. Is that what it is? That well, she somehow blocked you out. That's probably true. She manages to sleep while I snore, too. So, you know, that's pretty impressive because that stuff can get loud. That might be the case. And it might be just because you're unlikable. I mean, I don't know. Nice one. Why? Why do you say this? Oh, well, no, no. Okay, that same night. and Or maybe we didn't harp on it enough last week. But let's harp on it again. Okay. Harp. The computer froze oh, and we lost yeah, everything. that's right? right. Now, normally we would curse and take a walk around the block and let the computer cool off and then start it over and do it again. But you were just so disgusted that you're like, <laughs> no. And I brought a DVD over and we just sat and we watched the DVD. And I don't know, like a third into the movie, there was an earthquake. That's right. And that was my first earthquake ever, too. It was this tiny little earthquake. It was nothing like that Haiti thing that went on. It was like a 2.9 earthquake, if I Right, remember. yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I wasn't complaining that we had an earthquake. I, I, because, yeah, can you imagine? Yeah, we had a 2.9. Well, I don't know what people in Haiti are complaining about. Which is what I'm not saying, folks. I, <laughs> keep those cards and letters coming. But anyhow, so she comes in, she wakes up again and comes into the living room. And she's like, what are you guys doing? You're shaking the walls. That's right. And I was like, it was an earthquake. Sure, an earthquake. Yeah, you know, we didn't even realize it was an earthquake at the time because it was so short and it was so small and strange. It was just like... I hear that complaint all the time. (laughs) This conversation has derailed. It's just like the house vibrated for a moment. I remember both of us were kind of just like, what in the heck was that? And we thought maybe... truck had gone by yeah or car crash outside or an asteroid came down to earth and your cat had spontaneously combusted something yeah and you know what had we not quit to start that movie we would have been recording when that thing happened yeah that's been interesting pretty certain that would have been a strange occurrence oh well so yeah i upset her twice that night i mean thank god it was just twice right they say three times the charm or the camel's back is what do they say about three times something i think three strikes three times a lady Three, yeah, that's, that's it. That's, you know, it turns out that, uh, yeah, you did manage to zing her one more time. Zing! <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what a zing is. Thanks, announcer. <laughs> but yeah, that was the night we did our little uh, skit about you calling up and leaving a message that you were going to kill yourself. Uh, well, that was a skit? Unfortunately, uh, I, I didn't think to get on my voicemail and delete that one. And so uh, when my wife got home the next morning, she checked our messages and uh, she was just like, what is this? Rish is going to kill himself? She luckily realized that you were saying in the message that you weren't going to come and podcast. And she did know that you had come and podcasted. So so was she disappointed? <laughs> Who wouldn't be? I mean, really? I think Big is right. <laughs> 
She was just like, hey, hey, you got to tell Rish not to call me up and leave creepy sick messages on my <laughs> voicemail. Creepy mail. sick? Because <laughs> this is just not okay. If he's going to kill himself, he better do it. And decrease <laughs> the surplus population. Good times. Someday you'll look back on this. And I, I don't know that you'll laugh. Maybe you'll shudder. But still, you'll look back. <laughs> and that's all I'm promising. Yep. So you will look back. It will happen. Well, I guess that's that, huh? Indeed it is. So I'm I'm Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Did you know I'd give anything just to see you? Did you know that I'm a Sagittarius? Just like Mariah Carey is? She said it best. You're never going to shake me because, ooh, death worm, you'll always be my baby. Warning. Today's episode contains singing. Parental discretion is advised. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Please drop by iTunes and give us a five-star rating. We'd be eternally grateful you did. Take two. Thanks, Norm. You'll always be my baby. Aw, that... Wait, who are you talking to? <laughs> Squirrels leapt from limb to limb overhead, chattering directions. This is the way. Come this way. <laughs> <laughs>